I should have should have recorded that earlier part, but that's okay. That was the secret part for everyone who's here live. So thank you all for coming. Um, and as always, type your questions in the chat for Stephanie, and we'll have a nice Q and A after, and we'll do some breakout rooms so we can all say goodbye to each other for our Christmas holidays. Um, that's everything I'll say now. So go ahead, Steph. Thank you so much, Jessica, for that such a nice introduction. Um, I'm just going to quickly wait, can oh you can't see my screen yet. That would help. <laughs> now can you see it? Yes. Perfect. All right. Well, this is definitely more nerve wracking being on the other side of the hosting of these seminars. But I, yeah, thank you for everyone that came is coming today um, to hear about my research, uh, especially some people that are up past midnight. So thank you very much. Um, I just want to, I guess, say that my PhD wasn't a linear journey. So I worked on many animal pathogens from sheep to cows to crocodiles. Um, and I didn't come from a phage lab. So that's how I know um, a lot of you in the audience is probably reaching out to, for questions. I mean, I did uh, collaborate with some um, phage labs, so Steve Petrosky. Um, but yeah, majority of my research did end up in, and the entire of my thesis um, focused on the staph suit intermediate infections in canines. So I guess to start off, it um, is worthwhile introducing um, Staphylococcus pseudointermedius, which is a gram-positive cocci bacterium. And people often compare this bacterium to Staph aureus, as um, Staph pseudointermedius is commonly isolated from healthy dogs as part of their um, normal flora. However, in our literature review, we found that um, this is also an opportunistic pathogen um, isolated in numerous infection states. So um, ear infections, urinary tract infections um, and respiratory um, and reproductive tract infections. Um, but the main one that have a, lot, a lot of the research focuses on is canine pyoderma. And I'll go into that um, now. So canine pyoderma is one of the most common skin infections diagnosed in dogs. Um, and it presents in uh, like various locations around the dog's body. Um, and as depicted in the previous image, uh, Staph pseudointermedius is isolated as the predominant species involved in up to 92% of um, canine pyoderma infections. So this is uh, obviously very concerning as this bacterium um, shows high transmission rates between dogs and anim other animals um, species. And it's also um, zoonotic. So um, there's been a recent spike in, in, in numerous human cases as well. So generally uh, canine pyoderma is, oh, sorry, Generally, canine pyoderma caused by staph pseudointermedius is treated by long and repeated um, courses of antibiotics. So I guess it's no surprise to this audience that we are now seeing high rates of methicillin resistance staph pseudointermedius, um, isolated in up to 60% of canine infections. So due to these overwhelming uh, rates of antibiotic resistance, there has been a spike in research surrounding future um, treatments or adjunct therapy for um, canine pyoderma. So some of the work has focused on repurposing antibiotics for the um, veterinary sector. Uh, there's been preliminary work into vaccines against staph pseudointermedius. Um, multiple studies have focused on uh, various shampoos or topical applications um, containing herbal or active ingredients. And there's also a cream-based formulation um, known as staphylysate. Um, and this is basically where staph aureus is lysed by um, bacteriophages um, to release the cellular components um, to, I guess, to boost the dog's immune system and prevent further infections. However, um, this is more specific um, to Staph aureus and um, not so much Staph pseudointermedius. I also want to note that um, this isn't actually available in all countries, so that's obviously one of the downsides. And um, it should be noted that most of these options, as do a lot of um, different treatment options, has they do have um, high variability of um, efficacy. So therefore, um, I guess that's one of the reasons that phage therapy against staph pseudointermedius has also been explored as a therapeutic option. Um, as we all know, there are multiple positive um, or benefits of, or uh, I guess, yeah, positives of phage therapy. However, some of the top reasons that we feel that um, phage therapy would be a good option for staph pseudointermedius is because there has been, um, or there has been one at least, um, trial of phage therapy in dogs already. Um, and this was against a staph pseudointermediate, sorry, against a pseudomonas ear infection in dogs. And um, that trial showed high uh, levels of safety and um, efficacy, which is great. So that, um, I guess, gives us a basis to move forward with um, phage therapy in dogs. Um, 
And I guess we also appreciate the highly specific nature of um, phages. So we could potentially target the pathogenic staphylococcus intermedius, um, you know, not damaging any of the commensal flora and risking secondary infections. And lastly, as I showed before, um, Staphylococcus intermedius is involved in numerous infections, um, ear, nose, uh, urinary tract, infect, uh, urinary tract, etc. Um, so, but the same phages that we isolate could be manufactured into various formulations, IV um, injections, nasal sprays, and all of those kind of things, which would reduce the manufacturing um, lead time of phage therapy. So many studies, I guess, agree with this notion. So um, some studies have already started repurposing Staph aureus phages um, against Staph pseudointermedius, or I guess just testing whether they are, um, would lie Staph pseudointermedius. Um, however, the majority of the Staph aureus phages that have been tested only um, result in these turbid kind of plaques. So I guess further work would need to investigate whether this level of lysis is effective to clear infection or like enough to clear the infection. And um, so when I begun my PhD um, back in 2018, um, there were no phages against staph um, pseudointermedius specifically. However, um, a bit of a spoiler, um, about three weeks after I isolated my first um, phage, a paper came out from Ridley and colleagues um, describing the isolation and characterization of um, phages against staph pseudointermedius. So this was a very exciting paper as their phases showed um, preferential lysis against um, methicillin resistant staph pseudointermedius isolates. How un however, unfortunately, all of their um, phages did contain um, genes associated with lysogeny. Um, and as we know, uh, lys lysogenic um, phages are unlikely to progress in their current state as um, lytic phages are favorable for phage therapy in most cases. So um, with this being said, I did continue to characterize my isolated phages in hope that they would be purely lytic um, phages against staph pseudointermedius. So I guess before I continue my talk, um, I'll quickly explain how I isolated these phages as it's a very common question, but um, I'll just keep this brief. And if you have any more questions, you are more than welcome to ask later or email me. So um, I used a subset of 60 staph pseudointermedia strains that were isolated from um, a veterinary centre uh, here in Melbourne um, from canine infections. So these were used as my host strain um, in a standard kind of co-culture, um, phage enrichment um, culture. And then I added one potential um, phage sample. So I used water and soil samples from dog parks across Melbourne, as well as um, swabs and fur samples from healthy dogs. So after a period of incubation, I then spotted the filtrate on a double, um, double layer agar and purified any plaques that formed. So as we can see from this image on the um, left-hand side, after performing, I think it was, I, I did count it up a while ago, but it was over 200 um, different co-culture variations of different hosts and different samples. Um, we did successfully isolate um, phages that were able to do uh, lyse staph pseudointermedius as indicated by these plaques here. And what we found is that um, we had plaques of different size. So we had large and small plaques from um, soil samples, and again, large and small plaques from um, our water samples. Um, so the isolation of phages were also confirmed by T TEM imaging, um, which showed the gen which all of the four um, phages showed the general morphology of um, Cifoviridae uh, phages. And um, this was also confirmed by whole genome sequencing, but I'll come back to that in a moment. So upon characterizing these phages, we found that um, the four phages did have uh, variable host ranges um, as um, indicated down the bottom here. So able to lies between um, 10 to 53% of the 60 staph pseudointermediates isolates in our collection. Um, and this was just, uh, I guess, first shown through a simple um, spot test. Um, but then we did, uh, I guess, validate this through a um, using a high throughput uh, turbidity reduction assay using a microplate reader. So here we have um, in the dark circles here, we have just the standard growth curve of staph pseudointermedius. Um, in the gray triangles just below it, we have um, obviously the bacteria and they're just a very low concentration of our phage. So about an MOI of 0 0.1, um, where we so see no real effect on the bacterial growth. 
However, when we do add a, I guess, a higher concentration of our phage, an MOI of one, we see a, a significant reduction in our bacterial growth. So these, these were quite exciting that our phages showed really promising results at reducing stastid intermediate infections in both a static and a dynamic culture. To further um, these pr promising results, uh, we performed like an adapted version of a growth kinetic experiment for our candidate phage. So that was the phage that um, lies 53% of our isolates as that was the most promising. Um, and we found that after 45 minutes of adding the phage to the um, bacterial culture, we see a spike in this in the plaque forming units, um, which did reduce kind of quite quickly after that. And we can see that this is a very nice um, correlation to looking at the um, bacterial absorbance at that 45 minute mark. So in the culture where the phage was added at that 45 minute mark, we see a reduction in the um, bacterial absorbance or the turbidity, sorry, um, compared to the um, culture that did not receive the phage. And this was again really nicely correlated to um, a similar phenomenon in colony forming units. So in the culture that received the phage at that 45 minute mark, we see a very nice decline of the colony forming units to uh, zero after that 75 minute mark um, compared to the, the culture that did not. And I guess just to really emphasize the lytic potential of um, the ability, sorry, the lytic potential and ability of our um, phages, we also um, looked at the cells. Um, per frame using microscopy. Sorry, this is a bit, um, I don't know why it's got a bit blurry on this side, but that's okay. Um, so yeah, using the microscopy, we, we examined that there was a significant difference between the culture that received phage and the one that, and the culture that did not um, by 30 minutes. And um, I guess this is even obvious by eye um, at that one, 180 minute mark, um, as you can see, no, no bacterial cells um, were really evident um, compared to the one that did not receive phage. So these were very exciting results for our phage and its potential um, used to be expanded outside of the in vitro setting. However, I did mention that we did um, perform whole genome sequencing um, of our phages and we did, while we did discover that our phages were distinct to those that have previously been isolated, um, all of our four phages and unfortunately all phages ever isolated against Staphylococcus intermediates do contain genes that are associated with lysogeny. Um, so as we know, um, and as I mentioned before, typically phages with the potential to undergo um, the lysogenic life cycle aren't preferential for phage therapy. So we hypothesized that the phages that we isolated um, were actually temperate phages that excise from the bacterial genome. Um, and I guess we came up with this as during uh, lockdown, I couldn't really do um, any lab work. So instead I computationally analyzed um, the whole genome sequences of 59 Staphylococcus intermediates uh, genomes using FASTA to identify prophages within the gene, um, bacterial genomes. And what we found was um, a total of 221 um, prophages across the 59 Staphylococcus intermediates genomes with 70 of these um, being classified as complete prophages. So 70 potential um, prophages that could be excised from the bacterial genomes. Um, we found that 32% uh, of um, the 59 strains contain at least one complete prophage in, in their genome with one strain identifying to have six complete prophages. Um, obviously this would need further investigation, but that was very interesting. And I guess as we expect, um, the majority of these complete prophages um, were 40 to 60 um, kilobases in length. So that typical size that we um, expect for um, temperate phages. So this highlights the prevalence of prophages um, that are re readily able to excise from the genome of stacid intermediates. And I guess is an important consideration for further studies isolating phages against stacid intermediates. So it's also important to note that um, other studies have uh, induced these prophages from Staphylococcus intermediates um, bacteria um, in attempt to create ver mutants um, through random muta mutagenesis um, to create purely lytic phages. However, um, to date, they have been unsuccessful. So it would be interesting to look into site-specific modifications to um, remove uh, lysogeny modules. Oops, sorry. Um, so unfortunately, as I said before, the pandemic hit before we could um, 
like explore this any further. And here in Melbourne, we were locked out of the lab for um, most, oh, sorry, all of 2020 and most of 2021, um, with the exception of the last few months. But obviously I'd finished up my PhD by then. So we came up with an alternative way we could um, utilize these temperate phages that we had isolated. So as most of you would know that when um, phages lies their bacterial host from within in the last step of the lytic life cycle, the um, phages actually produce and utilize um, two main lytic enzymes. So we have the holon that creates um, a pore in the bacterial membrane, which allows the secondary enzyme known as the endolysin to access and um, degrade the peptidoglycan layer causing bacterial lysis. So interestingly, a handful of recent studies have shown that, um, um, sorry, applied purified endolysins um, without the phage or the holon um, to bacterial cells and have observed bacterial lysis. So therefore we thought that um, endolysins can also be regarded as an alternative therapeutic option. Um, so with these successful studies, we decided to computationally mine the genomes of all temperate phages against acid intermediates for their endolysin genes. So as I mentioned, we have um, four temperate phages that I have isolated, and then we had an additional 19 temperate phages against acid intermediates that were in the NCBI database. So we um, took their genomes and um, using BLAST, we um, yeah, mined for their endolysin genes. Uh, using Genius and Blast. Um, so based on this, we uh, identified, uh, I think it was around 27 different endolysin genes and aligned them all using N uh, Clustal Analysis and Genius. So based on um, the alignment of these endolysin genes, we identified uh, six unique endolysin genes, which have been uh, de-identified here. Um, they did vary in size, um, based on their predicted um, kilodalton size. Um, however, they all did, um, or were, were all identified as licensed um, at the protein level. So with these six endolysin genes, we sent the sequences to Bionia, um, in which the sequences were cloned into an expression vector um, for subsequent protein um, expression and purification. The expression um, vector was then um, transformed into E. coli BL21 cells, which are commonly used for protein um, expression and subsequent purification, which we did using our optimized um, protocol. So I just thought I'd quickly um, put up some SCS images showing that we successfully um, purified all six of our proteins, obviously um, some not so great um, as some of the stronger candidates. Um, but then we spotted these protein preps onto bacterial lawns of our 60 staphylococcus intermediates isolates and um, looked at their lytic activity. So the lytic activity of the endolysins was ranked um, from weak um, to, I guess, strong lysis based on their size and clarity of the zone of clearing. Um, and from this, we found that only three of the six endolysin preps were able to lyse staphylococcus intermediates, um, with one of our endolysins able to lyse up to 60% um, of the staphylococcus intermediates isolates. Um, so as you may remember, this is slightly more than our candidate um, phage was able to lyse, which is interesting. And um, something that was also interesting that we found was that um, not only was the were the endolysins able to lyse more of the isolates, but they were actually able to lyse at least one isolate from um, each of the infection sites, so skin, ear, urinary tract infection. Um, so that was really interesting. And we're also able to lyse um, multi-drug resistance isolates. So these are really um, promising results. And however, I can't um, actually talk too much about this um, as this is something that the lab is hoping to continue. So I will kind of wrap it up there, but um, I guess this just shows that endolysis could potentially provide a new avenue of research for um, staph pseudo intermediate infections in canines. So although we had um, very exciting preliminary results of our temperate phages and our endolysins against staph pseudo intermediates in vitro, there is an obvious um, need for in vivo models to progress any formulation further in the clinical field. So as we all probably know, um, mice models are the gold standard in many fields, um, including phage therapy work. However, due to ethical concerns um, surrounding their use, we decided to develop an alternative model um, for phage therapy trials, or at least um, have a look at whether another model would work. So the in vivo model that we um, developed uses silkworm larvae, so um, these ones here. 
um, as they have shown to have um, numerous benefits, including they're very cost effective to purchase and maintain. They have a good um, body size for handling. They do not require ethical approval. And um, very importantly, a recent study has shown that studies or experiments run in mice and silkworm in parallel show um, pretty comparable results. So that was, um, I guess, a good reason to con continue using them. So I won't go over all of the data today, but some of the key findings that um, we found when we were optimizing this model was when we extracted hemolymph, so the um, blood system of silkworm from healthy silkworms, um, and then mixed it with uh, at very various concentrations with a known concentration of Staphylococcus intermedius, um, we did not see any inhibition of Staphylococcus intermedius. So uh, various concentrations of hemolymph did not inhibit um, Staphylococcus intermedius, intermedius growth um, by uh, any significant mean. Interestingly, we also found that when we inject a known concentration of Staphylococcus intermedius into the silkworm, uh, leave them at their normal housing conditions for 18 hours, and then extract the hemolymph to quantify the bacteria, we see a significant, um, a small but significant um, increase in bacterial um, colony forming units. So I should also note here that uh, similar experiments were performed um, with hemolymph and phage, and we showed that the hemolymph did not inhibit the phage um, lytic activity as well. So this was obviously important to progress with the model to make sure that, um, to ensure that we had confidence that there would be no disruption of phage or bacterial growth and activity within the silkworm um, system. So in addition to the proliferation of Staphylococcus intermedius that we noticed in the silkworm larvae, when we injected various concentrations of Staphylococcus intermedius, we also see a dose-dependent survival of the silkworm larvae, as I'll show on this graph. So the different colours here um, represent a different concentration of Staphylococcus intermedius. So with the blue here um, on the left-hand side, indicating a low or the lowest bacterial concentration received, through to the red or orange um, here on the right-hand side with the highest bacterial concentration received. So the, after um, the injection of the various um, bacterial concentrations, we then monitored the survival of the silkworms across 72 hours. And as you'll see at 72 hours, we see that most notable dose dependent survival curve um, with high survival when the silkworms received low bacteria through to low survival when the um, silkworms received high bacteria. With uh, this green group here, um, identified as our LD50 group or the group that um, had 50% survival at the 72 hour mark. So for um, phage therapy trials, we injected the concentration of Staphylococcus intermedius that would result in 50% um, mortality of the silkworm group, followed by um, injection of our phage or endolysin administration. Um, we were then uh, record or yeah, monitor the survival rates over 72 hours with the aim of our phage or endolysin rescuing the silkworm survival back to 100% over the monitoring period. Um, so results from this workflow uh, were very interesting. So we found that when we injected our um, control substances, so PBS, um, either single or double injection, um, as well as our end license or phage alone, we see 100% survival, which is great. It means that our handling and our injection and our phage and end license are all safe um, in, in the silkworm. And when we inject our LG50 concentration of Staphylococcus intermediates, we see that really nice 50% uh, mortality, which we were expecting. However, when we um, inject either uh, I guess, moderate to high um, concentrations of our endolysin or our phages, we see 0% um, survival or lower survival rates than the um, bacteria alone. So this is definitely not we, what we were hoping to see. And um, while, again, we were unfortunately able to test this further, we hypothesised that um, either these concentrations of um, endolysins may be too high, even though that they were used in the, um, I guess, the control groups. Um, but we, we also think that maybe this 
could be an exaggerated immune response in such a small model. Um, so the silkworm being such a small model, yeah, this could be a reason. Um, as I said, we'd like to further test this by either um, injecting pre-lysed um, bacteria. So um, our staff did intermediates that has been lysed by the endolysin or phage um, in like a test tube injected into the silkworm to validate this or perform the same experiment in a higher order model just to validate um, these findings. So um, to test whether it's actually alphage and endolysin producing these kind of results or whether it's a model specific result um, would be very interesting. Um, Cause I also want to know that um, even though it uh, did not, uh, sorry, rescue the endolysins, it, these preps were still able to lyse um, the bacteria in, in vitro. So it wasn't that they had no, like they're no longer stable, um, which is really interesting. So I guess um, just to finish up this talk, I'm not even sure how long I spoke for, maybe I rushed through it, but just to summarize, um, we currently have a lack of effective treatments for canine infections caused by staph intermediates, largely due to antibiotic resistance. Um, therefore, there is a significant need for alternative therapies. So throughout my um, PhD, I focused on phage therapy with the isolation and characterization of um, phages against staphid intermediates. Um, however, all phages unfortunately were lysogenic or contained um, genes associated with lysogeny. Um, and that there was a high proportion or prevalence of prophages in um, the staphid intermediates genomes, both of which um, are important considerations for phage therapy moving forward. So still in the realm of um, phage therapy, I guess, um, from these lysogenic gene, uh, sorry, from these lyso lysogenic phages, um, we identified expressed and purified um, six novel endolysins. Um, and we have a candidate that shows promising um, results in our in vitro lytic assay or assays. Um, finally, we just developed an in vivo model, which um, provided very interesting results that require further validation. Um, in regards to phage therapy trials against staph pseudintermediates. But overall, um, I guess this project aimed to contribute to the field towards um, development of treatment options um, for staph pseudintermediates infections in canines. So I'll just leave, um, I'll finish up with my acknowledgements. So a huge thank you to the Halbig Lab at La Trobe. Um, I was with them for five, oh, four and a half years. So um, it was definitely great to have all of their help, even though, as I mentioned, uh, no one else worked on phages with me. Um, they are a predominantly, uh, viral, like they're a virology lab. So get some parallels there, but also thank you to all of the labs that housed me. Um, during my PhD, took me on as an adopt, adoptee um, and all of the funding bodies as well. Thank you to the Silkworms as well. Um, and I'll leave you on my contact details, um, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions, because I know what it feels like to, um, you know, have lots of questions and yeah, it's a great community out there. So yeah, definitely get in touch. Um, thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions that anyone has. Thank you so much, Steph. That was so cool. Uh, everyone can type questions in the chat. I think we have our first one from Michael. Uh, thanks for your talk. Great to see ongoing phage work for canine infections. I had a question regarding your prophage identification results. You had mentioned only 30% of isolates had complete prophages. Were these isolates mostly from one anatomical location on the canine patient? If so, could these prophages have been providing a fitness advantage? Yes, that's very interesting. And I, I guess something that I would love to spend more time um, yeah, we're working on, it was kind of a bit of a side project when the pandemic hit, everyone was in shambles just trying to um, think of things that they could do at home. Um, so it's, I don't have all the answers for that, but um, yeah, they actually work from a lot of um, canine skin infections. So as you mentioned, mostly from one anatomical location, um, because that's, I guess, they're predominantly found in that, um, in that infection. So yeah, it, it's very interesting thinking about how they could be providing a fitness advantage, but not something that I know, unfortunately. Definitely um, need extra research on that. <laughs> awesome. Anyone else has questions, keep typing them, or I'm going to turn on um, unmute and start video. So if somebody wants to ask a question verbally, uh, just use the raise hand function or just kind of unmute and go ahead and interrupt. Um, I have a question. The prophages, you were really surprised by how many there were. Is that I don't know anything about how many prophages tend to be uh, or how common they tend to be. Like, is this organism 
normal or weird in that way or what's known kind of about how how many prophages tend to be be there uh sorry in the stasis intermediate gene i'm like is this a normal amount yeah is that what you're saying sorry yeah my, i think my headphones are cutting out a little bit um yeah yeah it's a really good question so there actually was a um a study that also looked at the prevalence in stasis intermediates like pretty similar timing to me which seems to be the case um every time <laughs> um yeah and they found a, a very high proportion so obviously they used different um staff student intermediates isolates to me um because they were located elsewhere um yeah and they did also find a very high percentage of prophages so very interesting prophages are everywhere <laughs> um okay from Mikhail Skernik uh do these bacteria carry CRISPR system? Yeah, I, I saw that question and I personally do not know. I don't know a lot about, like I haven't looked into the bacteria, like besides looking at um, the prophages in the bacterial genomes, I haven't done a whole lot of um, bacterial genomics. So it would be very interesting to look into that. Um, yeah, I might talk to Mikhail and talk about how we can look at that because that would be very interesting. Yeah. Um, other questions, anyone from the audience that wants to ask a question verbally, share a comment. Um, oh, what's my other question gonna be? Oh, can you tell us about the um, the dog staff suit intermediates, like patient case that you started to try to help with and what the yeah. status on that? Yeah, so I was going to include that in this talk, but um, because it had, I guess, a spoiler, um, a bit of a <laughs> disappointing ending, um, I didn't oh, yeah. include it. But um, yeah, I guess it just highlights um, how important treatment options are against this pathogen because it was actually on Twitter, someone reached out asking if they could, um, if I could send my phages to them because they had a service dog um, for a, a patient with a traumatic brain injury um, that, had a, an awful um, nasal infection um, with staph suit intermediates as the culprit. Um, they tried everything, like I have the, the full patient history of the dog, that they tried almost every antibiotic under the sun, um, various different treatments over a, a year period, and the, the dog's health was declining. So I was like, of course, I'll um, help with my um, phages. But unfortunately, um, I guess the whole back, and I guess um, maybe a lot of people would um, know this, is that, it was hard to find um, veterinarians that were willing to uh, try, like, or, you know, um, administer phage therapy. So when she finally did, um, they couldn't actually isolate the bacteria anymore. So um, it seems to go in waves of being present and not present, but the infection still remaining or the um, symptoms still remaining. Um, so yeah, they kind of stopped there and said, well, if we can't isolate the bacteria, then we can't test the phages, of course. So that's where it kind of um, finished off. And yeah, I haven't really got an update since, but yeah, it's, I guess, a bit disappointing that there isn't this, like we're, we're getting towards a streamlined um, process, but yeah, that was the update there. Thank you. Um, okay, we have three questions that came in. Awesome, from Alex. Uh, great presentation, Steph. I like the idea of considering endolysins when phages are not suitable for therapy. What kind of endolysins do your phages have? Are they all glycosidases or did you find other like endopeptidases? Yeah, good question. Um, I was going to quickly share my screen maybe with this um, yep. image from my thesis because we did a little bit of analysis on this on like the domain, domain organization of them. Um, so yeah, it kind of varied um, to what kind of domains they contained. Um, Obviously, many had the chapter mean that we expect, um, glucoamidases. Um, yeah, I mean, this isn't a field that I'm super uh, familiar with and something that I'm still learning, I suppose. Uh, it was kind of off the bat of, um, as I said, the pandemic and just jumping into a new kind of project. So definitely wanting to learn more about how we kind of, um, you know, classify these um, endolysins and things like that. But um, yeah, it was interesting looking at their domain organization and hopefully that answers your question. Cool. I didn't even realize there were these different types of endolysis, but yay. Yes. Um, Tegan, congrats on your PhD and great talk, Steph. Did you find similarity between the predicted prophages and your lab isolated phages? What kind of formulation would you propose for treatment? 
That's a very great question. Um, so I actually started um, I uh, like uh, what's the word? Yeah, so inducing the prophages from the host bacteria that I isolated my phages on to determine whether, like, to do that direct. So I said that we hypothesized that the phages that I isolated were prophages prophages excised from the bacterial genome. So I started inducing them and um, doing whole genome sequencing, but unfortunately that kind of got left with the pandemic as well. Um, so um, whole genome sequencing of my phage um, did, it did match a prophage in the Staxo intermediate genome. So I guess that kind of also supports um, that it was likely a prophage, unfortunately, but good to know um, for next time. Yeah, as maybe it's an obvious thing to everyone, but try and, um, you know, select, bacterial hosts that don't have prophages. Um, but I guess that's, a, yeah, make sure that, because I used um, Stapsidia intermediates that was isolated from dog uh, infections. So obviously whole genome sequencing, all of them before using them would have been maybe avoided this kind of, um, but yeah, all good to know, all um, important information still. And what kind of formulation would you propose for treatment? Um, yeah, very good question. As I said, it depends on where the um, infection is located. So if we're looking at canine pyoderma, it would likely be some kind of um, hydrogel or um, topical cream. But again, um, I guess that's a good thing about a lot of treatments or but as well as um, phage therapy is that it can be formulated into multiple different formulations um, depending on where the infection resides. So yeah. Awesome. From Shanmuga, what is the threshold? What is the threshold you set for protein homology between potential endolysin candidates to determine an active protein in your initial searches? Great presentation. Well, okay. Um, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to go have a look at my. I'm going to have to look at my thesis, which I only submitted two months ago. But um, yeah, I'll <laughs> find that answer for you. Um, Again, something that I had a lot of help with from my um, collaborators, um, Travis Bajo, who's a protein expert. But um, yeah, it's a really good question. Awesome. Okay, from Hans, um, can the pathogen evolve resistance to the purified endolysin? Did you see that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Not something that I particularly focused on just yet because um, I only got to the stage of um, spotting them on there once and unfortunately had to finish up. Um, it would be really interesting because in order to evolve resistance, I imagine that it would have to change because the endolysins are targeting such specific parts of the peptidoglycan. Um, yeah, it would be interesting to see how the bacteria would evolve resistance to that um, and still maintain the integrity of its peptidoglycan. Um, yeah, I might have to keep you posted with that one if I find out the answer, if our um, strains become resistant to our endolysins, yeah. Okay, and maybe this will be the last question. A lot more come in. We have, we can still have some time before the breakout rooms. From Joseph, uh, besides being lysogenic, were these phages also full of other lethal genes like antibiotic resistant encoding genes? No, surprisingly they weren't. Um, yeah, kind of something I guess you'd expect being excising from the um, bacterial genome that they can carry um, antibiotic resistance encoding genes. But yeah, these ones weren't. Um, yeah, and they only had some of the lys lysogenic um, genes. And I guess something that I haven't fully researched into is like the, uh, what's the word, I guess, defective lysogenic um, phages, so that they've got some genes associated with it. Um, but I never saw them, you know, disappear, like, you know, go back into their lysogenic state. So, yeah, that would be really interesting as well. But no, not full of any other kind of lethal genes like that, which was, um, I guess, nice. Awesome. Okay, cool. Well, I think we will gear up our breakout rooms. Um, thanks, all of you, for all your awesome questions. So this is yeah, just, uh, oh, this is the end of the recording.